Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 29, Nebuchadnezzar and the Fall of Judah. Owing his authority solely because of the actions of Egypt's pharaoh, the puppet king Jehoiakim wasn't too keen on obeying his prophet's demands to switch sides. Jeremiah had warned of a massacre by the Babylonians, but this could be avoided by simply siding with them. Hmm, total destruction of everything he knows and loves? Or being a pampered despot? Tough call, but between 604 and 601, Jehoiakim plays both sides, giving tribute to each empire. Nebuchadnezzar had advanced all the way into the Sinai Peninsula, but Necho's army pushed back hard, reversing Babylon's fortunes and retaking the occupied city of Gaza in 600 BC. This was a great victory for Egypt, but even more so for Jehoiakim, who was fully convinced Egypt would prevail in this war. All tribute to Babylon stopped, despite knowing this would surely anger Nebuchadnezzar. But so what? He's going all in with Necho. But what was it that Assyrian general warned Hezekiah about all those years ago? Something about being cautious with relying on the Egyptians? Sure, dismiss it as a hollow threat. But one thing you can't argue with is that one victory does not make a champion. Necho had repelled Nebuchadnezzar and took back Gaza, but that was it. In the fighting, the army suffered heavy losses, and there were no more funds to support them. Necho was forced to slink back to Egypt, where he could contemplate his country's fate. Although one thing was certain, Judah was on her own. Jehoiakim would not live to see the results of his foolish gambit. In 598, the Babylonians were wrapping up a campaign against northern Arabian tribes, and in 597, Jehoiakim dies, just a few weeks before Nebuchadnezzar arrived at the walls of Jerusalem. Jehoiakim's son and heir, Yekonia, knew Judah was in no position to fight, and chose to surrender without struggle, a move many might perceive as cowardly, but deserves recognition and respect. Think of all the lives he saved, the suffering he prevented, just by casting pride aside and turning himself in. Well, not just him. His surrender also included members of the royal family, personal retainers, craftsmen and smiths, influential government officials, you get the idea. They were led in chains back to Babylon as VIPs, very important prisoners. And make no mistake, they were prisoners of Babylon. That said, Nebuchadnezzar did not cast them into some dank and foul dungeon. He treated the royal family as permanent guests and put the artisans and craftsmen to work contributing their talent for the glory of Babylon. That's not too bad for them, but Nebuchadnezzar isn't done with Judah quite yet. Before he returns home, he helps himself to the treasure within Solomon's temple and installs a new puppet king. This was Jehoiakim's brother, Matania, renamed Zedekiah because why not? A whole family of kings for hire. Now, Judah was financially depleted, spiritually battered, and anxious about each new day. The fearsome Assyrians, the folks who flay people alive and build human signposts, couldn't conquer Jerusalem, and yet both the Egyptians and Babylonians are allowed to just waltz in here and do whatever they want? Well, geez, how do you even know what to do next? Zedekiah was a bought man, true, but he was still a Judean. He saw how Israel was lost, saw how his own country was ravaged, and how his nephew and family were led away in chains. And something clicked inside him. There was only one clear path for him now. Make Babylon pay. Judah would bide her time and grow strong, and when the moment was right, God willing, oh, how Babylon would suffer. His plan was to play the long game, and for starters, that meant looking for allies amongst one-time enemies. At his palace in Jerusalem, Zedekiah received ambassadors from Edom and Moab, and from the Phoenician cities of Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. In secret, he discussed his plans and strategy for a future without another massive empire lording over them. They promised that their kings would agree to help him. We just have to play our cards right. Except who's still lurking around but Mr. Gloom and Doom himself, Jeremiah. He learns of this meeting and barges into the king's chamber, wailing and proclaiming death and destruction to those who refuse submission to Babylon. He's a little dramatic, but he's got a point too. I mean, what's the point of constantly plotting rebellion? To date, that has had a 0% chance of success. Fair enough, but while Jeremiah was marching around crying the end is nigh, another prophet, Hananiah, spoke to the Judean religious leaders and proclaimed that in two years' time, the yoke of Babylon would break and the exiles would return home. 
Oh, a positive go-getter. Let's go with him and forget about the old loony. Now, one can't rush into things, of course. That's what Hoshea did and look what happened to him. Cool and calm is the way to be. In fact, Zedekia even visits Babylon in 594, just to reassure Nebuchadnezzar of Judah's loyalty. Talk about walking straight into the lion's den. Now, meanwhile in Egypt, there's a new pharaoh, Samtik II, sometimes called Semeticus. Because it's been a while since a pharaoh has done this, for old time's sake, Samtik goes on a series of military conquests in Kush. And even though hating on the Nubians is so 13th century BC, he was so proud of his successes that he went on a parade through Philistia to advertise it, a region that was very much crawling with Babylonian troops who would have surely reported this news back home. It also came to pass that Samtik brought his tour to Judah, receiving a royal invitation to visit Jerusalem. There in the privacy of the royal palace, Zedekiah makes a startling admission to the pharaoh. Should Egypt provide aid to Judah, his people would gladly fight beside them against the Babylonians. It's amazing to think that a few episodes ago, Egypt was drowning Hebrew newborns and Moses was drowning their pharaoh. But water under the bridge. Samtik agrees to help Judah. This was the final component to ending Babylon's rule, or so Zedekiah believed. With his allies in the region, Hanania's prophecy, and now the support of mighty Egypt, Zedekiah makes the first move, turning on his Babylonian handlers and stopping the tribute. The kid gloves were off, and now it was only a matter of time before Nebuchadnezzar arrives, so Zedekiah decides to reach out to Jeremiah, no doubt a little concerned about his prophecy. With his priests and military leaders at his side, Zedekiah asks whether Yahweh will fight on Judah's side. Jeremiah responds with, The Lord says I will make your weapons useless against the Babylonians, and I will bring them right into the heart of this city. I will fight against you with outstretched hand and a mighty arm, with anger and rage and great wrath. And I will hand you, Zedekiah, king of Judah, over to Nebuchadnezzar, who will show you no mercy or pity or compassion. Everyone stood there in stunned silence for what must have seemed like forever, until one priest stood up and said what they were all thinking. Kill the lunatic! Zedekiah's supporters rushed Jeremiah, but were stopped from becoming murderers. Instead, the prophet is thrown in the stockades for a few days to simmer down, but even upon being released, he vows to continue warning the people of their impending doom. Now in the year 588, Nebuchadnezzar was getting closer, and Samtik II had unexpectedly died. Not something Zedekiah had planned on happening, and all eyes were on the new heir, Wahibre, or a priest, to see if he would honor his father's promises. Nebuchadnezzar had arrived in Canaan, and was working his way through the rebellious cities of both Judah and some Samarian ones as well, before finally his army arrived back at Jerusalem and prepared for a siege. Zedekiah nervously kept watch from the tallest tower in the city, hoping that any one of his opposed allies would come to his aid, when... In the distance? Yes, a priest had arrived. The Egyptians were here to rewrite the stories and save the Hebrews. Wouldn't that be something? Certainly that's what would happen if this were the movies, but this is real life, and people can be fickle jerks. What we know here is that a priest was enough of a nuisance that Nebuchadnezzar needed to fall back and engage the Egyptians. Then again, a priest is also recorded spending time fighting amongst the cities of Cyprus and Phoenicia. Well, that just means he's prepping for the big fight, you know? He just needs a little reminder to return to Judah, that's all. A priest receives a panicked communique to come and defend Jerusalem, to which his response is... No. Terrified and desperate for any help at all, Zedekiah turns to the only one who has been right all along, Jeremiah. The prophet is pleaded with to sway Yahweh onto their side, but again the same response. Judah is doomed. All right, Mr. Smart Guy, let's see how much you like being right when you're buried in the ground. Jeremiah is chained up and tossed into a water cistern, although a Nubian eunuch named Ebed Melek pleads for his release, which is granted for some reason. Yet still, he rants away with the negative Nelly stuff. Now it's January of 587. No more distractions for Nebuchadnezzar, no one to ride to Jerusalem's defense. The siege is resumed, and the walls hold on for another year and a half. But in the end, it was not battering ram or sapper that brought down the great city, but the twin evils of famine and pestilence. Jerusalem always had a good water supply. That wasn't the problem. No fresh supplies in that time, though. Well, it's a wonder they lasted that long at all. 
and with things at their bleakest, now in August of 586 BC, Zedekia tries to escape the city under cover of darkness, only to find his luck had run out. The well-fed and well-rested Babylonians easily overtake the fleeing king and haul him before Nebuchadnezzar. And now that Judah is without their king, well, the struggle seems pointless. Jerusalem opens its gates and surrenders. Nebuchadnezzar is merciless to his treacherous lapdog, devising a punishment sufficient enough to express his fury. Zedekiah's sons, who are all just children, are brought before their father. Zedekiah is then restrained and forced to watch as they are all slaughtered before him. Is there a more sickening thought for a parent? And yet Nebuchadnezzar had one further cruelty in store. Zedekiah's eyes are ripped out, so that this nightmare will be forever etched in his memory as the last time he had his sight. In this condition, he was hauled back to Babylon to live out the rest of his life in darkness and despair. As for Jerusalem, anything not nailed down was taken, and once thoroughly sacked, the whole city is set on fire. Everything from homes to shops, the palace and Solomon's temple are all reduced to ash. Even Jerusalem's walls are dismantled, so that no one could find safety within the city again. The citizens of Jerusalem were treated according to their status. Priests and officials were marched up to Riblah, the Babylonian headquarters in northern Israel, and executed before Nebuchadnezzar. The remaining survivors were marginally more fortunate. This is the diaspora, the mass relocation of the Judeans to Babylon. For the few that remained in the region, they were under the control of a Judean puppet governor named Gedalia, headquartered at Mizpah, just north of Jerusalem. The Babylonian occupation differed from the Assyrians in that there was no resettling of Babylonian colonists in Judah. The survivors are encouraged by Gedalia to accept their lot and embrace the simple life of subsistence farming. An unacceptable answer, and a group of Judean rebels break into his headquarters, killing the Babylonian garrison there and the turncoat governor. Not wanting to deal with any further insurgencies, by 582 BC, Babylon had expelled the last Judean citizens, thus officially marking the end of the kingdom. The prophet Jeremiah, who had done all he could to warn of this calamity, was left alone by Nebuchadnezzar. How dangerous can one crazy old nut be? Jeremiah wastes no time gathering as many refugees as he can, so he could lead them to safety in, ironically of all places, Egypt. For some of the Hebrews, at least, their story would end in the same place as it began. Well, no one ever said history had to be all sunshine and puppies, right? Terrible stuff, but that's life in the 6th century BC. The kingdoms of the Near East have duked it out, and four major powers remain. Babylon, Egypt, Media, as in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, and Lydia, a kingdom in Anatolia, and not the Near East, but a superpower all the same. Each will be discussed in turn, but as we're almost at the end of this episode, let's shift back to Babylon, where the Judean exiles are trying to adapt to their new life in a foreign land. Even though the Judeans were considered prisoners or conquered peoples, they were treated no differently than any other subjugated group. There was no special tax that they had to pay, no real limitations to what they could do. Well, I mean, except returning home or being free. The Judeans, although I guess that's not the correct term anymore, the Jewish exiles even become involved in the economic activity of the city, with some being able to purchase land and property. Others achieved some degree of wealth and took on governmental positions. On the surface, it appeared things would be okay, even as the Jewish elders worried that in time the people would forget where they came from. After all, many of the exiles were even given Babylonian names so as to further separate them from their heritage. It is during this time period that the Old Testament is put to words, a written history of the stories and traditions of the Jewish people. You'd think writing a book like this could be considered dangerously subversive to the government, but apparently the Babylonians didn't care. You can worship their gods or the Jewish god or any god or no god if you want to. The only thing that matters is that you pay your taxes. Very pragmatic. Nebuchadnezzar, the scourge of Judah, dies in 561 BC, with a quick succession of four kings and six years that follow. That fourth king, Nabonidus, comes in as an older man in 556, with a strange policy of diverting worship away from Marduk to Sin, a moon god. This highly unpopular move meant that Nabonidus spent a lot of time outside the city. 
His travels took him so far that he journeyed all the way to the Arabian town Jatribu, which is modern-day Medina, about 1,500 kilometers or 932 miles away from Babylon. This wanderlust meant he would often leave his son Belshara Utsur, or Belshazzar, behind as regent. Not too much is known about him, although Belshazzar is typically described as haughty and particularly nasty to his Jewish subjects. Now, the story goes one night that when Belshazzar was in the middle of a drunken feast, using gold and silver cups looted from Solomon's temple, his eyes catch a peculiar sight, for there on a wall behind him, someone had hastily scribbled some graffiti. He barks for Daniel, a Jewish noble and his attendant, to come and translate this gibberish. Daniel gasps and reads it out loud. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. Uh, what? Belshazzar's confused dinner guests shrug their shoulders. These are the Aramaic words for mina, shekel, and paris. Each are units of value, currency. It's like if someone wrote dollar, dollar, quarter, penny. It doesn't mean anything. Or does it? You see, Daniel is a clever man and figured out that it's a play on words. Specifically, that last word, ufarsin, which sounds similar to Paris, but closer to the word parsa, which we've heard before. Put it all together and work it around a little bit, and you get a translation that's something like, you, meaning Belshazzar, have been weighed, like a bag of coins, and found wanting by the Parsa, the Persians. First off, weren't they allied with Babylon? And for that matter, it was the Medes who were in command, not the Persians, their less civilized cousins to the east. But Daniel had not read this wrong, and Belshazzar felt his heart sink. Little did he know that on that very same night, his life would be forfeit to one of the greatest leaders that has ever walked upon the earth. A man who forged an empire that at its peak contained nearly half the world's population. His epithet, the Great, is not only a reflection of military victories, but societal ones as well, as he is widely regarded as a champion of human rights. This is Cyrus the Great, father of the Persians, liberator of Babylon, savior of the Jews. And his story will be told next time on the Podcast History of Our World. Huge thanks to Michael Levy for his musical contributions these last few episodes. If you'd like to hear more authentic ancient sounds from Israel, Greece, or Rome, visit ancientliar.com. Support the artist and pick up an album from wherever you purchase your music.